Oh. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we are we're past the midway point of the Global Education Conference. We're in day three. There's a lot of C. Gray has given us some conference reminders. You've probably seen this about a dozen times. But there is a chat box on the front of the network. It's a great way to communicate with others. If you're having any trouble getting into the conference, we do have a hashtag. It's Global Ed 13. There's going to be a survey that pops up at the end of your session. And please do fill it out and let us know uh, what you've liked and what you can improve. Lucy says there's another session ending up. So people are going to be floating in. Yes. We also recognize that with close to 200 sessions over the course of a week, a lot of this will get watched in recording form. Recorded form. Uh, we do love the partners for the conference. So I think we have over 90 conference partners. If you're a school or a nonprofit organization and you would like to partner, please look for the partner link on the site. And then we're just getting ready the discussion group for the five projects that were proposed in our opening session. So those discussion groups, as well as many other forum conversations, are taking place on the website. And we encourage you to go there to participate. Thanks so much to our sponsors and supporters, especially to IRON and the Global Campaign for Education. They've made this free conference possible, and we appreciate it. And John, a survey, a survey. OK, this is your chance to let us know where you're participating from. New Zealand is on the map. Nice. Click to the left of the map, clicking on the star icon. You're clicking twice, then you're clicking on the map. Let us know in the chat as well. Somebody said they were tired of this map. I never get tired of it. <laughs> I love where people are from. And there's John. And there's India. India. Oh, yeah. Awesome. North America looks like Hawaii. Well, now I know it's a map of India. It looks like a little more keenly in recent. <laughs> <laughs> Keep uh, put put a note in the chat as to where you're participating from. Maybe the time and the temperature. It's always fun to know, and we'll let you keep doing that as we move forward. I have to tell you, this is the most lovely logo. I love it. Thank you, Spending the time over the two of you. Okay. Well, do you want to tell us you want to say So, uh, thank you for coming, ladies. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And I'm uh, sorry, I'm a little bit late here. I I haven't taken a shower all day, and I was trying to look presentable for you, but unfortunately, <laughs> I think I fell asleep in the shower. Um, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, I want to introduce everybody here at the conference to Karen in particular because um, and Mika, it's, it's nice to meet you uh, virtually. They come from the, my favorite school on the planet, uh, the school at Columbia University, uh, which is in New York City, and has been one of the most progressive schools I've seen in general in education, particularly around the use of technology. And I've um, foisted myself on visiting the school several times, and I'm getting to know Karen and her former director of innovation, Don Buckley, who was also a keynote, and a, a fellow uh, uh, former colleague, Andrew Gardner. And I think it's a really special school, and I think you're going to enjoy hearing more about it, hopefully, through this presentation and beyond. And um, and their recent trip to India just sounds really fascinating, and I can't wait to hear more about it. You should also know something about Karen in particular. She is the most traveled person I know. She has a friend who lives in Thailand and, and sees her just about every summer, I think, and they go all over the place. And um, the funniest story around her travels is, I uh, was in Hawaii in 2010 in the summer to do a presentation. I was in the mall in Honolulu, and I checked in there and saw that Karen had checked in, too. And I had no idea she was going to be in Hawaii. And so we got together and had drinks that night, and it was hilarious. 
Um, so it's a very small world out there, and um, I think these are two very special people that you're going to really enjoy getting to know. Uh, you definitely want to follow Karen's um, work. They're follow both of their works online, but Karen is a prolific Twitterer and Flickr person, and um, she looks like she's going to faint because I'm saying too much about her. But no. uh, anyway, let me let me uh, pass it over to you guys. But we're so happy to have you here. Thank you for doing this. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I just wanted to say that I knew you were in Hawaii because I was tracking you on Foursquare. <laughs> so it was just a matter of time before we actually did connect. Um, but thank you so much. That was really the nicest introduction I've had in a very long time. And I'm really honored to be here and keynoting with my colleague, Ray Kapori. And she'd love to tell you about the, um, what, what she founded, Line Global, which is her heart and soul. Yep. And so I'm going to turn it over to her for a moment. Okay. Well, Steve, I'll start with your observation of the logo. I'm glad you noticed it because it is a masterpiece uh, designed by Milton Glaser. And if any of you do not know who Milton Glaser is, he is an iconic graphic designer who actually made the I Love New York logo. And if you are close to age as me, I was a teenager and had his famous Bob Dylan post up in my room. So it's like a dream come true that Milton Glaser actually did this for me. It's one of the biggest, most special things in my life. So yeah, so that's a lot story. of special things in her life. Right. Um, so I'll just start with Line Global. Um, Line Global is really an opportunity, of course, to make global connections and you know develop cross-cultural competencies and all of the wonderful stuff that everybody's talking about all week. But I always like to think of Line Global or global education really as journeys that we make. And I don't mean physical journeys, but really the internal, the personal journeys that happen within when we meet different people and we talk to different people and we learn with different people. Um, so it, I always think of it as personal stories. And for me, it starts with my dad's story. Um, my dad grew up in a little village in India, and against all odds, got an amazing education, which was a rare thing. He was the only person in his family who finished school, went to medical college, went on to Edinburgh to become a surgeon. So I grew up knowing that an education makes all the difference, and I knew that first time. Um, and then, you know, that shifts, of course, to my story, which is incredible that I grew up with a father like that. I had access to everything because of him. And then when my husband and I moved here to New York like 20 plus years ago, it was really interesting because we grew up with what we call a very English education, which is what, the be you know, the best of what the English or the Brits left for us. This is very, again, going back, Steve, you talked about earlier, very traditional, very sit in straight lines, you know, a classroom of so many studies. So I, I studied and learned very differently. And then coming and working in the U.S. as an educator has definitely transformed me. And then being a mother of an 18-year-old and watching how he learns and how he challenges us and all the kids that I work with and the people I work with, everything kind of led up to uh, getting an NAIS fellowship for aspiring school heads. And that was wonderful because I had to work on a project. And I've always had India in my heart and at the back of my head. And so I wrote up this project, Line Global, of connecting educators in India and the U.S., not with the idea of, you know, this happens over and over again. We all know this. Many people go to the developing world as, oh, let's go see what we can do for them. Mm -hmm. But Line Global is really not what we can do for someone. It's how we can learn together and work together and learn from each other. So that's really how Line Global got started. I want to wait. I want to interrupt for a second. So I, it's awesome that you were inspired by your dad, and it's interesting that you're in education because I'm I'm third generation educator. My right. grandfather was an English teacher. My mom was an English teacher, and my sister was a social studies teacher, and my other sister was a math teacher. And I started off teaching math, and then I got into technology over the years. So it's, it's, it's just nice to be around people that truly love education and, and are truly inspired by educators and just want to further that in any way possible. So I'm glad that we connected. And I just want to give a little side story, which is that um, Rick and I, so we're at the School at Columbia University. I'm the middle school uh, technology, technology integrator. Um, I really help support 
tech in, uh, in the middle school for students and teachers. So I help them remember that everything they do online is public, permanent, and traceable, and that technology should be used academically, respectfully, and responsibly. So that's my thrust. And Rika is the director of admissions here at the school. Yeah. Um, and it's funny you were talking about uh, the the like you leave them and you, what was the what was the expression you used? Oh, I, I like to joke that I actually am the OBGYN of the building <laughs> because I deliver all the lovely babies who come to kindergarten. But I hold them for two seconds and then I pass them on to the classroom. How awesome is that? <laughs> I I actually have a very privileged role at the school at Columbia. So I've got two OBGYNs is basically that's not that's not appropriate. Sorry, Steve. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to give that background. That's how we, we know each other because this is our sixth year working together. And in June, um, uh, we had a kind of unconferency uh, day of faculty training at the end of last year. And uh, people got to stand up and say, I want to have a conversation about this. Well, I want to have a conversation about this. And Rekha stood up and said, I want to have a discussion about global education. And I made a beeline for her table. And we haven't really collaborated much because I'm in the middle division, so I'm at the old, it's a K to eight school. So I'm, I'm basically, <laughs> thank you, Lucy. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'm at the top of the uh, age wise of the school. Rekha's uh, getting people in at all grade levels, but mostly kindergarten, so we don't always interact. But I sat at her table and she told me about Line Global and she told me about this this idea of a trip to India where our head of school was going to go and she was going to go, and I'll get into this later, but I immediately said, oh, you're going to be in India? You're going to be connecting educators? I wonder if you can have some sort of an ed camp while you're there. And then suddenly that launched this very long discussion and two days of solid um, collaboration, and then we can, we, that, that's going to be later on in our, in our little presentation here. But she has just explained how Line Global came to be and what the purpose is, and we just went on the inaugural trip. Yeah. So before we go on the inaugural trip, I always like to call Line Global my arranged marriage model. I'm sure many of you know this from India, but I grew up with a mom and a grandmother who said arranged marriages work best. I never had one, by the way. But Line Global truly is because it's really about finding connections, finding what's common and of interest between a school here and a school in India, and then working on that, not imposing an agenda on anyone in India. Um, so we started, I started this not-for-profit with lots of wonderful people on my board or, you know, contributing towards it with expertise, with finances, and it took more than a year to get it off the ground, and we finally went on our first trip to Mumbai, just, we got back three weeks ago. Not even three weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. I was jet lagged, which was helping me get to work on time, but it's actually officially over <laughs> based on what time I arrived today and yesterday. It's our secret. Um, so we have, we have more, we have some images that we'd like to show you, um, and I'm just going to use this now. So this is the team that went, and starting from the left, we have Matthew Stewart, who's the head of school at Cadman. It's a pre-K to five uh, Montessori-based School, school on the Upper East Side. Um, then there's Jennifer Donovan, who's a science teacher at the Trinity School. Um, then there's Reka, looking gorgeous. And then there's me, <laughs> looking like I just ate two lunches. And then there's Emily McCarran, who is a remarkable. She's at the Punahou School in Honolulu, and she's the director of their international of the international center. And she's also the chair of the East Asian Language Department during the school year. And then the International Language Center convene. She works on it all year long, but they convene over the summer, and they have a program for kids and a program for grown-ups that Rika attended this past summer. And then there's Amani Reed on the on the far right, who's the head of school here at the school at Columbia University. Um, so those, these are the people that went. It was my first time in, in Mumbai, and this is what the view was from the Westin Hotel, uh, 22nd floor at night. Super crowded, crazy, awesome, busy city um, that really doesn't sleep. And this was an example of jaywalking, because um, <laughs> these people <laughs> actually did. Traffic is horrific. I mean, I've been in other cities with traffic, so I was prepared for that. I just wasn't prepared for the level of jaywalking. Um, so people are just going between cars. And kind of pushing the cars out of their way. Um, and just, just quick images, like kids going to and from school. Um, and then this was, this was a scene from a car. We spent a lot of time in traffic going, visiting schools, visiting uh, sites. We can talk about that in a moment. But um, the lady seated was taking offerings. And in exchange, she would give you some uh, food to feed the sacred cow. 
So I thought it was pretty amazing that, uh, yeah. boom, like that was out of the, out the car window, and it was the best thing I've seen in a very long time. So besides visiting schools, Reka is basically, Lucy Gray <laughs> and Reka, I'm realizing, are two of the most connected people I've met in a long time. And so Reka, at one point, we went to Crystal, which was, uh, how would you, it's like a, Place like Price Waterhouse Cooper, like they're in, what do you call that kind of like company a, that regulates and monitors uh, corporations? So, and her friend, um, Rupa. Rupa, is the CEO and founder and the managing, uh, managing director. managing director of Crystal. And we got this amazing report about the economy of India and the fact that when people say, like, oh, yeah, I'd love to do business in India, um, the, the, the next statement is, which India? You know, because there's so many different Indias, just like there's so many New York cities, just like there's so many different ways to be American or South Asian or whatever. Um, so, I, and I was reminded of that TED Talk by the woman whose name I can't remember, which is about the danger of the single story. So this is a pretty meaningful slide to me because depending on which India you're talking about or which school you're talking about, you end up having all sorts of different conversations and possibilities for conversations. So do you want to explain this slide? Because <laughs> I'm no financial wizard. Well, I'm not a financial visit either, but I think that the whole focus of the trip to India was not just meeting schools and educators, but really immersing the team into India. So whether it was going to our friends' homes to have meals, or it was learning about the Indian economy, as you can see here, or we went to Columbia's Global Center to learn about education at a real macro level in India, it gave everyone a much deeper, broader understanding. So um, this slide really shows like the number of billionaires we have in India and then the extreme poverty we have in India. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, I'm not good at explaining any of these numbers, so I'm not going to try, but I think you can see that it takes so many Singapores and so many Australias and so many Indonesias, et cetera, all rolled into one to make India. Yeah, so the, and, and uh, it's, it's just fascinating to me that the entire, the lowest, um, an income class of sub-Saharan Africa is in, within India, and that lower middle class of Indonesia and the upper cl middle class of Thailand, all of those uh, sections, these segments of society are within India because there are so many people in India. Yes. So it's pretty fascinating to see that and also to see the, the population in millions. And I just want to say that we're going to be sending out uh, Steve Hargaden and Lucy Gray Gavin, and, and other people involved with the conference, take all of these sessions and record them, and you can download the slides via the Global Education Conference but we'll also be sending a link to these slides as well um, because that one's a pretty powerful one. Yeah, and we really have to thank Rupa Kudva, Crystal, and Mr. Joshi who presented to us to actually share these wonderful slides with us. So. Yeah, um, and if you are going to perhaps share the slide, if you could just respect that this is research and, and maintain the fact that the Crystal, you know, logo yeah. on the top right. I'm a big fan of encouraging people to cite sources and be respectful with uh, images and stuff and resources they find. So anyway, sorry about the lecture. Um, this is uh, this is another slide they showed us when we got a presentation. So this is a great slide about there's no doubt that India is a superpower, but we still have lots of steps and you know steps forward, steps backwards, and I think the Economist has these super wonderful, funny yet not funny covers, and uh, that should give you a good sense of you know everyone always talks about India as the elephant that's kind of ambling along, big, heavy, lots of problems and China as like the super duper fast, you know, quick tiger, everything happens really fast. So that, that's the usual imagery that's used. Um, and uh, this one is really funny how India got its funk, but uh, I think this kind of brings up, you know, the back and forth for India is the challenges like perhaps not the best infrastructure, politics, corruption, uh, you know, poverty, there's, there's plenty, plenty of challenges in India, but then there's wonderful opportunities. Um, would, do we want to do the next slide? Sure. Yeah. And one of the most wonderful things happening in India right now, which could be the best opportunity, or of course an extreme challenge, is that the youth of India is, you know, this is from 2010, but right now I think it's almost more than, way more than 50% of India is young. So we have this upcoming workforce that needs education and work skills, and the question now is can India meet that? Um, and then, so we had the opportunity to listen to um, economists describe India, which was fascinating, and I learned a lot. Most of the notes I took are 
elsewhere, unfortunately. But um, and we also went, met with some NGOs. So uh, we met with the people that run Moon by Smiles, and we met with people um, who uh, Masoom. Yeah. Was that what? Um, and basically, they're doing night school classes for kids um, that are working during the day, so they can only attend night school, and they're desperate for an education. So they're setting up schools on the streets um, and in any location they can gather. And it's fascinating how there's, there's, everyone's trying to get educated in some way, shape, or form, or they're concerned about how to educate the masses because their population is so young. It, it, you can see from the slides. Oh, and at this point, this is from 2010 data, but the most recent data, I think it's closer to like 60% of their population is below 25 years old. There's something insane about having and that many people. And it doesn't even say how many that is in millions or billions, but it's a lot of people. Yeah. And then a story we heard over and over again in India that I can kind of reinforce this elephant tiger thing that I talked about was that, you know, in China, if you had to build a, a railway track, you, you know, they would just build it right through no matter who was living there and what was happening. It's plotted, it's going to happen, and it happens overnight and boom. But in India, we have this kicking democracy that's very active and alive, and it would take human rights groups and all kinds of things. You can just build a line right through something. And so that, on one hand, deters progress and deters infrastructure, but on the other hand, how wonderful that, you know, democracy and human rights are for real, so. Not good Yeah. Um, so we went to visit a bunch of schools as well, and it was interesting to see, like, this This was um, on the wall as you enter the Birla School, Birla World uh, Academy, and we thought that was pretty beautiful. Um, we saw different kinds of schools. Um, this was... Uh, how would you describe this one? Like this was, in, it was like, it's more like an independent school, right? More like an independent school. But I think this, uh, this uh, slide is poignant because it just shows like spirituality underlying everything in India, uh, no matter what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then we went. Uh, here's another school, and this was this was fascinating to me because this was the Wujaya Shah. Very good. School. Um, um, by the Goldrich family. Uh, and so, and it started as a school where the, the workers, the employees of the Goldridge families, uh, uh, companies would, would go to the school. And I don't, I think it's okay to say that they were also kind of interested in family planning in a, in a kind of very interesting way um, because they let two children from the family attend the school. For free. For free. And beyond that, you were responsible for paying for the education or locate, you know, or figuring out how to educate any other children. So it's a kind of, Interesting thing, but this is like a maker space. Yeah. So in this school, they had a bicycle linked up to um, a food processor, and when you pedal the bike, um, the carrot gets chopped. And there's actually that silver thing on the top is a blender, and there's a white thing in the middle that's the food processor. And I was just like, this is this is what's happening all over Manhattan independent schools right now. Everyone's setting up maker spaces, and here they have industrial arts, and they have. Um, uh, they had like a cooking class and they had sewing classes. Home economics is what I'm trying to say, which is like what I grew up with in the uh, 70s and 80s. Right. Um, so I thought it was pretty awesome that here, here's a makerspace. Yeah, and I think besides, you know, the traditional education aspects in India, what's really interesting is India's really innovative. Uh, and it has always been because of need. Uh, so in India, we call that Jugaad educate innovation. Jugaad really means something that's frugal and quick. So it's like, you know, an example would be putting a diesel machine on a bullock cart. That would be Jugaad innovation. We've been doing that for centuries. Um, I think it just comes naturally to us when the electricity goes up, steal a line from somewhere and get your electricity. That's Jugaad innovation as well. So I guess the question now is when it's happening in schools, what do we learn with each other and how do we uh, actually use that? On both sides. Yeah, because you were also, we, Rachel was talking to me earlier, and we were, like, preparing for this, and we were talking about, you know, the idea of schools getting together, and you have to consider, like, which schools, which school in America, which school in India. Um, there's these, every, every, every place you could possibly think of has upper, middle, and lower classes, that, and upper, middle, and uh, populations that attend different kinds of schools, independent schools, public schools, charter schools, whatever. So it's just interesting that, there's all these different models you could possibly follow, and it's a little mind-boggling when you think about making these connections. And we were talking about um, empathy, and I was saying how Samantha Mora, who um, a lot of people know, she's online, she's on Twitter, she's, I think she's a principal at a public school in Philadelphia. She always says, and many other people say, 
but I've heard Samantha Mora say that empathy is the 21st century skill. And certainly, um, Rachel was like, yeah, Gandhi said that too. <laughs> so they, uh, let's not forget that Gandhi was amazing. Um, and also, I was going to think, I was thinking about Homa Tabangar, um, Growing Up Global on Twitter. Um, and she, who wrote the book Growing Up Global, and she's always talking, about, she goes all over the world and travels. And when she describes, or when she has conversations about what makes a good global citizen, um, she finds that adults and children all over the world basically describe what it means to be a friend. And she hears this description all over the world that empathy um, is necessary. And being a friend is similar no matter where you are. So it's pretty cool that, that we're, we're trying to, break a line global is trying to reinforce and build global citizenship, excuse me, global citizenship skills on top of everything else. So building connections from teachers, uh, students, school to school, but also reinforcing the idea that we are global citizens and we have to remember that and act on it because that might be the only way to truly teach empathy, I guess, these days. I don't know. I might be babbling. I'm sorry. Um, this is us at lunch. Um, I took the picture, um, which is why I'm not in the picture, but uh, at the uh, Oberoi International School, and they hosted EdCamp. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you want to talk about any of that before we move on, though. So our trip to India was really thanks to three amazing women and their selfless work, and that would be Ami Modi, uh, who runs uh, two schools in slum areas, as well as her family puts children through college um, for free, I think a few hundred, at least 400 children. Um, and then Firoza Godrej, uh, who is um, part of the Godrej family that does incredible work for India. and. Um, Gayatri Oberoi, who runs the Oberoi School, and they, that's how we're tying back, uh, actually hosted um, a big event at Camp Mumbai. So I guess I'll just show a picture of at Camp Mumbai. So um, basically, and this is what started this, this our, our particular um, collaboration. In June, when Reka said she was going to Mumbai, she was bringing Amani Reed, our head of school, um, I knew I, I was already planning for Ed Camp NYC. And I went to the first ed camp in Philadelphia in May of 2010. And I was like, immediately I went there and I said, we could do this in my school in a heartbeat. So we launched Ed Camp NYC a couple months after Ed Camp Philly. And we were one of the first offshoots. And if you're aware of the Ed Camp movement, um, I hope you realize that it's awesome and it's all about hacking professional development and getting people to really think about personalizing the experience. And there's a, it's an unconference model. So the, schedule board is empty until attendees arrive and put up sessions that they want to talk about. So we have a slide which gives an example of some of the stuff that we ended up having. I'm just going to jump ahead to slide 19. So these, these were the sessions that people decided upon when they got to EdCamp Mumbai. Um, uh, creating a different differentiation, uh, differentiation system in your classroom. I'm stuttering. I'm okay with that though. Uh, promoting equality and diversity. I, I did a session um, on how to build a PLN, um, and I just tried to think of all these free ways of establishing a personalized learning network. Um, I used to say professional learning network or personal le learning network, but these days I've been hearing personalized learning network, and I kind of like those, those, that word better. Um, Jennifer Donovan led a session on the biodiversity project. Um, I ended up joining up with a couple of teachers from the Oberoi School about uh, finding safe uh, online resources for elementary students, and this amazing uh, librarian named Silky, S-I-L-K-Y, um, lovely, wonderful, awesome librarian, just ended up sharing a ton of resources with us, which was great, because I tried to explain that at an ed camp, you're not lecturing, you're not giving a presentation necessarily, you're just facilitating a conversation. Right. And thankfully for me and for the two teachers that wanted to have this conversation, Silky came and gave us a ton of resources. Um, but back to this whole thing, I said to Reka, just, we can have an ed camp, and maybe there's a way to cross-pollinate between ed camp NYC and ed camp Mumbai, and maybe we can figure that out. And then uh, it turns out that I got to go and on this trip and actually facil facilitate ed camp Mumbai, which was the first ed camp in India. So the plan is for many more to follow, for ed camp Mumbai to be an annual tradition and for there to be other cities that host their own. That would be awesome, because if you that look at the ed camp map, um, it's edcamp.wikispaces.com, like that's the, that, that's the official uh, place where everybody puts their edcamp stuff. 
there have been ed camps all over the world, and we launched the first one in India. So it's a source of pride for me. Yeah, and getting the support of the Oberoi School and their head, Vladimir, was absolutely amazing. Uh, and then the other amazing piece uh, that was the first was having Sri Srinivasan actually Skype in and do the opening session for EdCamp. And, of course, he is absolutely incredible. So for those of you who don't know him, please, I think it's Sri.net. Uh, he's currently the chief digital officer of the Metropolitan Museum and uh, one of the amazing people that sit on the line global board. But having him actually Skype in and do an interactive session with the audience was really powerful. I think you can see him way in the back on the screen there. Um, and also it kind of, you know, everyone saw that, wow, we've made personal connections and we can actually continue this relationship via technology. They actually looked that and felt that. So that was really powerful as well. I'm putting Shree's information in the chat room, Shree.net. Um, he actually, is it okay to say that his kids go to the sure. school? So he's a parent at the school. And one of the things I organize is TEDx NY Ed. Lucy has presented at TEDx NY Ed. Homa Tavanga has presented there. Shree Srinivasan. Um, luckily, I come across awesome people who have ideas worth spreading. So uh, another way of doing professional development is having like a TEDx or like an event like that. So um, he he's great among among other people who are awesome. Shri talks about how to be appropriate online, and so he gave a talk to the parents at the Oberoi School on a Friday night, and then he helped keynote at Camp Mumbai Saturday morning from New York, mind you. He was in New York and just basically. It's like 24 hours with Shree. Um, he basically is like his own global education conference, I guess. But um, he just talks about how to be appropriate. He's got awesome, powerful slides. You can see them all at Shree.net. Um, and just like be, be personable, be knowledgeable, be funny if you have to be funny. Um, be friendly, be open. Don't be like weirdly pers like intimate. Like that, that doesn't belong online. Um, and so he, he gives really good, understandable, approachable advice, and he can give it to teachers or to parents or to whoever. So I, I highly recommend him as a speaker or to look at his stuff. And then this lovely team that went, I mean, I think uh, it was an incredible uh, trip because of everybody here. Uh, they completely embraced India, and everyone, I mean, it was a great team because everyone has different expertise, and I think that's going to be really helpful, and it is helpful as they're planning next steps, is to get their experience and their feedback. Um, and it was interesting because people had no idea what to make of the EdCamp session board. Right. They were like, what? You mean, uh, what do you, what? And it was, it was I mean, I, actually, this was my sixth, well, this was my fifth EdCamp. And then two weeks later, I, uh, we had the next, the, the next EdCamp NYC. So it was like an EdCamp October for me. Um, but um, this is my fifth EdCamp NYC. The most recent one was my sixth. So I, I'm used to giving the spiel as to how to, you know, fill in the EdCamp board. And it was just so interesting that the idea of, putting up a session because one didn't exist yet and you could learn whatever you wanted to learn was kind of new to people. And yeah. when we built, we asked for feedback and a lot of people did say that, yes, this was their first unconference. So hopefully a lot of people talked about maybe they take that model and bring it back to a professional development day at their own school. Um, I think I, I think it's the best way to learn. Um, it keeps me interested and motivated. <laughs> that's, that's a, one wants me to be interested and motivated. Otherwise, I'm a complainer. You know? Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, and also here's just another image from EdCamp. Um, Rachel right, looking awesome, and here's an example of a session. You know, and this this uh, we not every session had everybody looking at the front. Um, other after this was this was the first round of separate sessions, and then the next ones we asked people to move their chairs into a circle. So we were prototyping it for people um, and asking them to just be a little more. Uh, collaborative and and and, and have facilitate it. conversations yeah. versus present. Yeah, and and I'm I'm a big fan of peer pressure, so I was peer pressuring people to talk. Um, I was able to shut my mouth at times and allow the silence to encourage other people to talk. But it was cool because I said and I maintained that I need to learn as well. I'm not just gonna sit in a room, you know, and, and chat the whole time. Like I want to know what are the what are you thinking? Um, we had a couple of people come to the session. I facilitated about, you know, a PLN, a personalized learning network, and it was funny to hear names come up, like Tom Whitby, who came to EdCamp NYC, and Rachel got to meet him on, was that November 9th? Yeah, yeah it was November 9th with EdCamp NYC, the most recent one. So Tom Whitby is infamous for leading a PLN uh, uh, session at every EdCamp he attends, and people, people go to them, and I've seen this man put up 
PLN on the session board for years. And every and you went to that this year. And yeah. there there's always it's always a valuable conversation. What what some of the takeaways you had? I'm putting you on the spot. Right. You're putting you on the job. Yeah. I think I learned about um the board, you know, like how what what's it I forget what it's called, where you can actually go in and you can see ev all the tweets that they have the time board. Time board, thank yeah. you. That was that's something new. I love that. Thing. Yeah. Um yeah, some guy here that Chris Powder, I don't know, we can look at the tag board to see it. But um it, it's just interesting that so I, I basically was caught I was walking in Tom Whitby's footsteps when I thought, Oh, that's the session that I'll leave and there were some people there that were really big on Twitter in but from Mumbai and sharing talking about how it's free and it's twenty four seven and they share a lot of resources and I talked about how there's different hashtags like side chat, math chat, ed tech chat, whatever, um, SS chat for social studies, ELL chat for English language learners. So just knowing how to use this constant stream of information in order to develop yourself professionally seems to me like a valid resource. And then other people share things I didn't know about, like um, certain uh, either conferences to attend or listservs to join or whatever. And um, in the slides, there's a link um, to here, there's a link to uh, the resources page. So uh, we try to gather notes from each session in a Google Doc, like a collaborative Google Doc. So from my from the session I facilitated on building a PLN, you'll, you can find whatever notes are there. Um, I'm gonna and then we're, and then getting feedback from everyone who attended uh, at Camp Mumbai was interesting because it was a first for everybody since it's, it was the first one in India. And and now the conversation is really next steps and how do we grow and you know continue that conversation, but continue it in a way that's authentic, that's meaningful and valuable for everybody involved. Um, and it's been interesting to read new things that are happening. Like there was recently Vivek Vatva in California talked about um, kids in Silicon Valley who have no access to uh, technology and how someone there actually donated the Akash tablet, which is what the Indian government is wanting to use for kids who cannot have, who don't have access to technology in India. So it's fascinating that we both have the same issues and we both coming up with creative, innovative ways to solve these problems. Um, so, you know, that's always inspiring. Um, we're thinking of actually, um, I love, uh, Steve and Lucy, I really love this whole board that you have and that that is interactive and people can raise their hand. And I saw this at the opening session and I was like, okay, this is what we need and to have a monthly conversation with everyone we met in India and keep growing that community and sustaining conversation. So so thank you for that inspiration. Yeah, she loves uh what is this blackboard? Yeah. yeah. Um do you wanna so we have more next steps too? Like uh, including other cities beyond Mumbai, we talked about sustaining and building community, um, keeping people connected, um, and I love the idea of having monthly meetups or, or something, some conversational strand or topic. Right. Um, and then once we propose that, we're of course waiting for feedback from everyone involved in Mumbai. Uh, but all of you who are here today, we'd love your ideas. Uh, it's always good to, you know, hear from someone who's removed from a situation to look at you and go like, ah, how come you are thinking of that? That mm -hmm. seems obvious. So, so thank you for any feedback or ideas you may have. Um, I wanted to also touch upon this, which is that you, you said, you were talking about this yesterday, and you said that the government recognizes, like, why India? And even the government, Obama was recognizing the importance of U.S. and India connections and the value that, that, that's there in, in building a strong relationship. And colleges recognize that. And even uh, Columbia University has a global center in, based in Mumbai. They have like right. seven worldwide. I think, I think we heard uh, Rio and Paris and someplace else. Some Jordan. Jordan and someplace in, on the African continent. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I can't sure. remember. I'm sorry. But basically, there's seven of them, and there's the one in Mumbai. Um, so that was kind of cool. And Rekha was thinking, like, what about K-12? What about building these 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 citizenship, these, this global citizenship uh, curriculum very early on, so that it's way more natural? Um, so that that was something that I just wanted to remind. Because I look, we have notes. <laughs> I'm going to show our notes. Look, we plan for this. So, you know, I don't know how many of you follow Young Zell's work, but I heard him when I was in uh, Emily's wonderful Punoho school in Hawaii this past summer. He actually Skyped in to chat with the group. And he said something that really stuck, struck with me. 
um, that how important it is that we develop the cultural IQ and EQ of our kids and ourselves. Because if our kids are allowed to be creative and our kids can innovate together and they can work together, they're far less likely to wage wars on each other one day. And I thought that was really mm. profound. So not only is it whatever next steps for line, it's about having the empathy, having respect, um, having humility to learn and not, you know, say, oh, you know, it's all, it's everything we do in our school is wonderful. Everything you do in your school is wonderful, but everything we can do together is far, far more wonderful. Um, so we'll end, I guess, on that lovely, peaceful note. But and before we end, I just want to point out that I've got the chat column on the screen, and John in New Zealand is the most incredible, look at him, he's like Mr. Research, everything we well, mentioned. I've got to see a thing with my glasses oh. on, sorry. You just have to see that everything we've mentioned, he's brought up, he's gotten the hyperlink so that you can see, like, oh, look, at Camp Philly, boom. Oh, thank you. Yeah, he, here, there's the line global um, the, the link to the brochure, and he's linked to, it's amazing, at camwikispaces.com. I mentioned it, he links it. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's amazing. So we'd, we'd love to hear, I mean, this is a PDF which you can look at of the team that went to Mumbai, and not just the team, but everyone who supported us and helped us along to make a trip possible. So that's uh, interesting information. And um, we'd love to, do we want to go to the next slide? Oh, gosh. Um, which is the keep in touch. Keep in touch. Yeah. Please keep in touch. But is there, it would be really fun to know what are the first words that come to all your minds when you think of India? I would love to know that. Um, so I think you can just stick it in the chat window. If you don't mind typing in the chat window, just what do you think of when you think of India? Okay, so I'll be your eyes. <laughs> okay. I can see that. Large oh, and populated. Can. There you go. Colorful. Diversity, yeah. Microlending. That's great. Rich history. Cows. Oh, that's perfect. Huh. Oh, the high school for women. Garlic. Does that seem Gaelic or gar I'm Lizzie, I'm kidding. I think it's garlic. That's awesome. Are you a foodie? I'm, a, I'm an eater. <laughs> I'm an eatie. Um, my friend, uh, I was going to make a plug, my friend's Bangkok Glutton, Lucy mentioned her earlier, and so it's my best friend from college, and she's Bangkok Glutton on uh, Twitter, and she writes, and she, she reads, and she eats. Um, so, any, let's hear if anyone has questions for us, or comments, or feedback, we'd appreciate that. Or, and actually, maybe we can also think about, you know, um, uh, be, consider how and when and why it's important for U.S. kids or teachers to connect with India and for Indian kids and teachers to connect with the U.S. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that in seventh grade, <laughs> Big Bang Theory characters, that's awesome, first of all. Um, I'm thinking about seventh grade, they happen to be, they do a study of Delhi, so it would be pretty natural. I mean, it's almost a little too easy, but it's also pretty natural for somehow the kids to get something authentic, like we can connect. And Steve mentioned, of course, the, um, the time difference. But uh, there's got to be a way to be asynchronous, but still authentic in building connections. I'm smiling to someone about Bollywood. Yeah. That's my thing. <laughs> um, yeah. But basically, I mean, what and when and how do we study each other's culture or history or economy and religion? And why not get, like, this, this is a true primary source, you know, like making a connection, making a friend, uh, you know, abroad, gathering information. Um, yeah, I have a question. I have a question with you guys. Um, what are your next? What are your next? What are your next steps? Um, elaborate. How can we help? How can we participate? How can we um, carry on what you're doing? How can if we wanted to go on a, a junket to India for an ed camp or something? How would we do that? Uh, let us let, give us some details because I'm like I I, I want to come. Oh, good. That's wonderful. Yes, I think this first trip was really valuable and, and important because, like I said, I've been working and planning this. I mean, it started with me, and then, of course, nothing happens just with me, thank goodness. Uh, lots of wonderful people got involved in Line Global, and we actually managed to go on our first trip. And it took more than a year to get to, to this point. We actually, last November, had our first event, and we were lucky enough to have Jeff Sachs speak about the importance of global education. So I call that my friend-making event. And now that we actually have done 
next steps and actually being with our first ambassador group to India. We've been sitting and meeting and getting feedback from India. And of course, you know, I think, you know, I keep saying this, we've got amazing, passionate people like you who just want to go and amazing ideas, amazing, amazing educators, and then amazing educators on that end. And now we're working on funding because that's, uh, you know, that's, we need that to make it happen. Uh, but fingers crossed, if we had our first trip, we'll have the next. Okay. But instead of just waiting for the funding to happen to take the next trip, we want to start. Now that we've made the personal connection, which I think is crucial, um, continue technology-wise. Um, so, for example, with the Goldred School and then um, Genocide Trinity has this uh, great biodiversity project, is to get them involved on that. Or Emily at Puno, who is toying with the idea of, you know, language uh, tutoring for kids uh, who uh, go to an after school uh, with a not-for-profit organization there who don't have English. Um, so we, we're coming up with lots of different ideas that would work on both ends or our monthly chats. But again, if anyone else has ideas for us. And we met, or was it just last week? And we met the, the people that went on this inaugural trip, uh, met, and we talked about it. Does it make sense to get their teachers from there to come here or to encourage more people from here to go there? Or are, are both of those trips valid and important? Um, can we offer professional development opportunities? Um, could it be, is it, do we offer, do we encourage student driven projects, teacher driven projects, um, just teacher to teacher connections? It, there's, it's, it's hard because this is the beginning of it. And I think, you know, what I learned from the trip and watching the team understand India was really important. So it wasn't the surface, let's look at schools or let's talk to another educator. We really went down layers deeper. And so I keep thinking of having some kind of summit or conference here to give people a much broader, deeper understanding of India. So that's another thing that I'm trying to put So um, I, I think I've been talking about um, you know, taking our show on the road a little bit, mm -hmm. and we're, we have no, we're not anywhere close to producing anything, but this is, the idea that we had um, stemmed from a trip that I took with Apple as an Apple Distinguished Educator. Um, we went abroad to Prague and Berlin and did um, digital media projects on the road and created curriculum in 2006. Mm -hmm. That's what started this whole thing for me. Well, and EF, to, EF Education were the people behind it that produced it, that, that did the logistics and everything. Mm -hmm. And um, this last spring I did some work for them and kind of reignited the connections there. So one of the things that we've been starting to talk to them about is because they know the logistics piece really well and they can get, you know, tickets cheap and that sort of thing because they buy in bulk and whatever. I mean, they have that whole system down you know, could we do a professional development tour somewhere where we would partner with nonprofits to get people to come? I mean, people would have to pay for it. It would not be, you know, underwritten unless we had some major benefactor. But, you know, I think there's some people who would do this. Um, you know, let's, so let's say we got, we, we convinced, um, you know, Iron and, you know, Primary Source or whomever to come mm -hmm. along on the trip and act as, you know, curriculum experts and, and that sort of thing and, and do tours and do create some stuff on the road. You know, that's kind of what we've, we've been tossing around, but we haven't figured out, A, again, the funding. Um, B, you know, I, this, this stuff takes forever to plan, and, and we just have to do it. The other thing, too, is, and I don't know if you want to mention this at all, let me just mention this one thing too. Steve, you should talk you should talk about what you're doing this year in North Carolina and maybe that could be a potential resource too. I don't want to put word, um, words into his mouth, but he's doing something really interesting this year that might be of, of use. He's stepped away, I think. Oh, he's troubleshooting in another room. Okay. Well anyway, he's doing this is he there? Akilu Yida stepped in. He's in Seoul. He used to be a teacher here at the School of Columbia, and now he's teaching at Seoul International School, and he joined this session just to say hi. So I appreciate it very much. Do you want me to give him the mic? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, well, it's, Tabitha. it's Tabitha Johnson, who's engaged to Akilu Yida, and they moved to Seoul together to be at Seoul International School, and apparently they're so close that she logged it as him. <laughs> I can Tabitha is an amazing teacher librarian, uh, awesome resources, and her fiance, Akiyo Aida, is an incredibly gifted educator. So um, 
Tabitha, she just said, no, he's in the shower now. <laughs> so, so do we have any questions from anyone or any other comments? I have one more thing I just want to say, which is that Tabitha and Akio are hopefully going to be organizing EdCamp Seoul, which will be the first EdCamp in Korea. So look out for that. Um, 2015. I think I met Tabitha before they moved, right? I think I met her. I think you introduced me to her. I know you, I remember you talking about them. That's great. It's, it's a small global, global world here, isn't it? Yeah, there was an Ed Camp uh, online, but it wasn't, you know, I don't think you need to call it global. There was one recently, John. Maybe Karen knows about it. I think they called it Ed Camp Home. Okay. So, uh, here's, my yeah. audio is, is in and out here. Sorry, my bandwidth is, seems challenged. One of the things I wanted to ask too was, um, okay, so there's EdCamp Home and EdCamp Online. One of the questions I had was, do you have any recommended resources for schools that want to study about India? Um, are, do you have any recommendations for, uh, you know, great websites that have curriculum and that sort of thing? Well, we're putting all that together. So, you you know, you'll see that soon on the Line Global website. We're working on lots of little pieces. So that's the joys of, you know, the steps of growing and building a, a new organization. So how does this fit into the your fellowship? Um, so much, is it so much for being ahead of school now because this has taken off? Or, well, well, um, was a year long, and I think, you know, what was nice, you know, that's something we talk about in the fellowship a lot, fellowship for heads of school, is like, you know, it's a, it's a great way to know whether you want to become a head of school is by doing this. And I, I think I, um, so far I may, hopefully someday, I'm not sure yet, but I think for now I'm happy that I founded my little organization, and I think heading that has been incredibly rewarding, incredibly challenging, and I'm learning so much uh, that I could apply to maybe being ahead of school. I think being ahead of school requires a lot of entrepreneurial skills, and, uh, you know, you have to be resourceful and be able to plan and execute and produce, and right. um, and obviously you've got that. If you, put, if you pulled this off, this is amazing. Thank so, um, if you. So unless anybody has any more questions, I, I, here's a question we do. Um, uh, John asks, do teachers in schools in India have unmetered uh, internet access to use for such online conferences? How is the access there? Well, that's again going back to us. It's a great question. And again, going back to which India. So yes, the, some of the schools we met that are like most in, like the independent schools in New York or, you know, really well resourced. And then there's schools in the middle that have wonderful programs or that, you know, the little innovation with the bike you saw, but not great internet access. And then the schools with absolutely none, and we saw all of them. So that's now, I think, going back to the empathy piece and all the pieces of really being sensitive is how we have to be creative of how can we pull in those schools that had no internet access. So would it be by collaborating with the schools in Mumbai that have it when we have our chat? Um, you know, we, we have to figure that out. Or maybe getting people to gather at a location right. with access, and that helps them build connections also, you know. Right. Um, we also talked about how most people have phones, you know, so maybe there's a way to, you know, bring your own device or use your phone to do stuff. There, there, there have to be creative solutions. I mean, yeah. there have to be. Yeah. So well, we would be really excited to share once we figure lots of things and I take our big, next big step. And we met, we met the people that were doing the night schools, for instance. I had gone to this uh, startup um, launch event, and there was a woman giving, um, forgive me, I will remember this later, but there was a woman talking about her startup idea, which I hope it's okay to share, and, um, but it was just doing a lot of um, basically downloading uh, audio content for your phone so that you could uh, lecture. So you, if you can't get to the web, and view a video, maybe on your phone, you can just download an MP3 and listen, and how this is incredibly cheap and easy. And that's, that's a big thing happening in India, actually. Yeah. And there are lots of and NGOs doing that in India, because uh, the cell phone um, industry there is, so I think, way superior to what we have in the US. Uh, really affordable. You know, when I grew up in India, even just a few years ago, 
everyone can have a cell phone. Now, everybody has more than one cell phone. Uh, it's affordable. It's accessible. Uh, so that, that would be a great tool as well. Yeah, so and then it could be cheaper if it's not video, if it's just audio. Like I was just thinking about there's ways to do this. And maybe maybe we can help build the content. Maybe we help them build content. There's a lot of opportunities here. And it, the point is is that all of these ideas we can be prototyped. Because this is the beginning. This is not the end. There's no end. There's <laughs> no end at all. Except to end the session, I guess, unless someone else has a question. Otherwise, um, you, this is how you keep in touch with us, and I hope you do. And I hope you tell others about it, and we'd love you to be involved and yeah. collaborate. Another thing that just reminds me of is um, we lost you. Ooh. We have to look at John's tool called Slide. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. and. Uh, is, can you hear my voice now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because my audio seems to be going out, so I'll end this quickly. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the one last thing I was going to say was challenge-based learning might be kind of a cool model to use with this somehow, too. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate this. The recording will be available about 10 minutes after we stop recording today. It will be available in MP3, MP4 format in addition to the Blackboard recording, so you can download it and use it on a website or whatever you need to do. But thank you. We really appreciate it. It sounds exciting, and we'll be following your adventures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see one forward. What's that? That's so they can see the, see the slides. Ah, so we can see the whole.